everyone. I'm John Evans. Welcome to another episode of One on One. It's news that fans of Outer Banks have waited to hear. And no, I'm not talking about that stretch of land along the east coast of North Carolina. I'm talking about the hit television show co-created by Wilmington's own Jonas Pate, which went to number one on Netflix during its second season. Season three will be available soon, February 23rd. And that's when we can catch up on John B., JJ, Pope, Sarah, Kiara, and Cleo as they begin life on the deserted island. Now, I asked Jonas to be my guest to talk about the show, the upcoming season, all those great young actors they have on the show, and how much Outer Banks reflects his own experiences of growing up along the coast. Jonas Pate, welcome to the one-on-one -on -one with John Evans podcast. Thank you, John, glad to be here. Fans would kill me if I didn't start out with this question, What's ahead for the Pogues in season three, Jonas? I come up, no spoilers, John, no spoilers. Uh, we are incredibly excited. We're getting ready to go out for the premiere in Los Angeles. We feel like it's our best season yet, but it comes out so soon. I would just say, go watch it. It's going to be out so soon. Uh, it's going to uh, be exciting. There's a lot, of, a, a lot of adventure and a lot of friendship. But it, the things that you liked about the first two seasons, if you're a fan, you'll, there was more of that. They've lost the treasure, not once, but twice. How many times can these kids have it right in the palm of their hands, Jonas, and get it taken away? Depends on how many seasons we end up doing, John. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we, we sort of felt like they needed a win this year, so we tried to give them one. When you and your twin brother, uh, Josh, and Shannon Burke pitched Netflix on this series idea, Jonas, did you pitch it with these Indiana Jones type adventures in the back of your mind, or was it going to be the Pogues against the Kooks, and then we'll just see what happens? We believe it or not, we always had this dream of what if it, what if you were with this group of friends and it it started on what became the greatest adventure that anyone could ever possibly imagine. That it would start really small and really local, and slowly over time build and build and build. It was hard to pitch that to Netflix right off the bat because it's such a grand idea. So we pitched them sort of the, really the first season. And then once it became successful, we realized we could start telling the story bigger and bigger. But believe it or not, we always hoped it would be that. Why have viewers related so well to your characters? Do you think it's the class divide thing? Do you think it's the settings? Or is it the young men and women that you have playing these central roles? I, I think it's a little bit of all of that, but I think friends, just the friendship. I remember this thing came out in the middle of a pandemic and all these poor high school kids were stuck at home without a connection to their friends. It's lonely. I think this whole generation is lonely because of these iPhones. And I think they long for more human connection. And I think that was real in the series. It's real on screen, it's real off screen between those casts, between our cast. And it bled through into the work. And I think that more than anything is what did it. Talk to me a little bit about these actors you have. Chase Stokes, Madeline Klein, Madison Bailey, Rudy Pankow, Jonathan Davis, Carlacia Grant, and I don't want to forget Drew Starkey as Rafe because I think he's done a really good job as well with the role that he's had uh, as the really the opponent who's really taken on a more major role. How have they risen to the challenges that you and the other writers have put ahead of them. It's honestly been so much fun to watch these kids grow. You know, they were all unknown. They were all Southern with the exception of uh, Rudy, who was from Alaska, which I kid him. I'm like, that's really Southern. You just yeah. don't realize. And, um, and so, uh, and then they just really, um, they worked hard and it's been fun to watch them grow. Like I just got a text I can show you this. You'll laugh. I just got a text from Madeline Klein who, I mean, this is what's so surreal, who just got put on the cover of Cosmopolitan. Here, I'll show you wow. the picture, right? So it's like, it's crazy for this girl from Goose Creek, right, if you can see this, this girl from Goose Creek, right? That's about to come out, who had wow. had one line in history and was starving in LA. And now three years later, she's the on the cover of Cosmopolitan. So it's just been, okay. 
that, that how'd that happen? We're still not really sure, but we're thankful. Have they almost become, I know you have two kids, you and Jennifer have two kids, Yeah. but I mean, you've really kind of watched them grow, not grow up, but grow in For talent sure. and maturity level. So I would imagine there's got to be a little, some kind of fatherly thing going on with you and these young men and women. A hundred percent. You definitely feel incredibly protective of them and having worked in the, in the business for a long time, I've tried to impart what little wisdom that I have and help them navigate all the crazy things that are, have happened to them, but they're all great kids. They're, they all have such good hearts. They're all, you know, they haven't changed one bit since the first season. So it's just been exciting. It's just been a blessing to watch this stuff happen to them. How do they continue to impress you? Have you guys, maybe consciously ramped up what you're asking of these kids? Yeah, I mean, you can imagine they've gotten better because they've just done it a lot more. I mean, you know, they've spent a lot more time in the saddle, so they're a lot better now than they were when they started, for sure. Was there a special moment maybe in, as you were shooting season one or as shooting season two, that you thought to yourself, we've got something special here. You've been on a lot of projects. Yeah. But was there something in the hit in the back of your head, a certain moment, a certain time when you said to yourself, this has got the possibility of going yeah. further than many of the others? You know, it's so funny, John. It's like when I was younger, I would really think about what would happen to a project. I'd worry about what were the reviews going to be? What was the reception going to be? Was it going to be successful or not? And then you get older and you realize that the process is, more, is almost more important than the product. And as we were making this thing, I lived, you know, I grew up in the Carolinas. I grew up in Rayford, North Carolina. I moved out to California for 20 years. I got tired of it. I moved back and suddenly I'm back home. I'm back where I grew up in the, you know, marshes of the Carolina coast. And I'm telling a story that had a lot of overlap with our high school life in Rayford. And I just remember thinking, man, this is awesome. This is just so lucky. So I didn't think like it was going to be a hit. But I knew it was a special experience. And I think the, the cast did, the crew did. You know, almost all of our crew is from Wilmington. And they're folks that I've worked with for 25 years. These are old friends. Bo Webb, the cameraman, was on my first thing when I was 23. <laughs> Carol Peterman, Michael Jefferson. These are all people that are local that I've known and worked with for 20 years. It's awesome. Would this series have gotten made, Jonas, if it wasn't for the rise to prominence of the streaming series like the Netflix, the Hulu, the Prime Video. You know, when you think about the times when it was just ABC, NBC, CBS, TNT, TBS, it seems like this series, many others, really are thriving because of the delivery system. True? For sure. I think it definitely helped. I mean, there have been, you know, there's precedents in Wilmington of shows that like this that have succeeded like Dawson's Creek, of course, and One Tree Hill. So every decade or so one comes down the pipe like this, but uh, but you never know. It definitely helped that there's more outlets than there used to be, for sure. You've been in the business a long time, you said. Can you go into a project with sky high expectations? Or do you just say, I'm going to do the best I can for as long as I can and really roll the dice on the viewers liking it? I try to do the latter. I mean, we just shot a pilot in Wilmington about a young rock band that I'm so I'm so excited about because the band is so good. I mean, that's the best part of it. These like 19 year old kids are just unreal. We put this band together. We pulled musicians from all over the country. And so we've shot. So I'm super excited about that. Will it be a hit? Man, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be a hit, but I know I like it. So got to trust that. And if you can, and if you can look yourself in the mirror and like what you do, at yep. least in my career anyway, if I can look myself in the mirror and say, I've done the best I can, yep. I can walk away and put my head down on the pillow at night and be okay with it. A hundred percent. Once you get to that, it, your life gets a lot easier. You're like, you, you have self-respect. So you're like, well, come with me. Take me back to the day, moment, hour that you shared with the kids that this series made number one on Netflix. What kind of day was that? I mean, it, it's the whole wild celebration. I mean, just wild, off the chart, jumping up and down, screaming from the top of your lungs, joy. Because it, you know, it's very unlikely for a show like this to get picked up, like you say, to have that kind of success was, uh, no one saw it coming. So it was just great. It was like winning, you know, it's like winning the ACC tournament, man. 
<laughs> or winning that Powerball jackpot for $747 million, right? Exactly. You mentioned earlier you grew up in Rayford, North Carolina, but you spent a lot of time along the coast. I've read, as I did some research for our talk today, that some of the situations, maybe some of the characters, were based on your experiences, whether it be in Charleston or Wrightsville Beach growing up. True? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of it. You're always pulling from things that you've experienced and kind of twisting them around to make a new version of it. You know, the, the car the kids drive was my high school car. Um, you know, a lot of characters that we pulled from were inspired by people that we knew. And then we just sort of pushed it further. You know, we'd always heard this, this story of Denmark Bessie, which was the slave who won his freedom in a lottery in Charleston and then um, was was later hunted, sadly. But we so we sort of twisted that story into the story of Denmark Tanny. It's all just a combination of things that happened to us and things we've read about and threw it in a blender and hit, hit play. Do you still have some of those old VHS movies that you and Josh made when yeah. you were kids? They're sitting in the attic right above me right now. Yeah, I haven't watched them in a while. I'm scared to. <laughs> <laughs> Where did the love of movies come from, Jonas? Just watching TV? What what sparked it? My old man would say, you got to watch this Western with me. And we would watch the outlaw Josie Wales 900 times. And that's more than anything. It was Westerns with my dad. You know, for a while there, we would watch Lonesome Dove every year. That's classic television. It's the might be the best thing ever made. Like you can take Yellowstone. I'll take Lonesome Dove. Yeah, that's that's great stuff. You met after you went to college, you went to New York and met a man named Peter Glatzer. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. That's right, yeah. He helped you make your first movies. As I talk to people, I always say, who's that one person in your life, in your career that really meant a lot to you? Would Peter be that person to you? He was a, for sure, as far as get, doing more in the early stages to get things going, he was hugely instrumental. He was young too. And so he took a chance on me and we took a chance on him and he helped us get the money for this first little movie that we shot in Wilmington called The Grave. And then um, with some of the spokes that are still on Outer Banks and um, uh, and then that got into the Sundance Film Festival and got going from there. But here, here's a good story. You'll like this story. When I first got out of college and I had a script, but I didn't know what to do with it. I knew that Dennis Hopper had bought that building down on Front Street. Mm -hmm. And so I, I got a sheet and I spray painted on it. Hey, Dennis, I got a script. Here's my number. Give me a call. And I hung it on the front door. And then I wow. called and then I called the Star News and I was like, some idiot just hung a sheet on Dennis Hopper's front door. And they went and took a picture of it. And it was on the front page of the paper. OK. And then a month passed because Dennis wasn't there. He's off in Hollywood doing something. And I'm watching the Carolina Duke game. Phone rings. Pick it up. Dennis says, hey, do you have that script? Come bring it to me. So I go straight, I haul, haul ass down to Front Street, I meet Dennis Hopper, I give him the script, and he helped me get the money for the first movie. That's an amazing story. Yeah, it's hard to believe it happened. I look back and I'm like, and I think now, like, he was like 70 at the time, and I was a 23-year-old nobody. And I think, how cool is he? <laughs> how cool is he to help me like that? Yeah, those yeah. are the things you try to pass on to the next generation. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, trying to do that now. We have lots of young people on the crew that we try to get going in their careers. After The Grave, which made it to Sundance, after The Deceiver made it to the Venice Film Festival, were you walking a little taller? Did a little you too say, tall. Hey, I'm on my way. Here we go. I think I was walking a little too tall. I think I thought, uh, why do people say Hollywood is hard? This doesn't seem that hard. Um, but then reality, of course, set in. It is hard. And, uh, you know, if your first movie isn't Citizen Kane, it's almost better to be a total unknown than to have made one mediocre movie because now they know you're not Orson Welles. So I was going to um, say, I was gonna say yeah. you can only take people by surprise once. Once. And then after that, they feel like they got your number. So that, but so I, it actually was a blessing, though, because it led me to start working in television a little bit and television. You actually have because it goes quicker than movies. You can kind of you can refine your craft. So I felt like I became a better filmmaker, a better storyteller over those years working in TV. And every now and then I'd get to do a little movie. But um, but yeah, it, it, it wasn't always that easy. That's for sure. It got harder after that. I think the general public, Jonas, might think 
when you get onto a movie set, the director's the big boss. Yeah. And, and he's in charge of everybody. But, you know, when you were directing some of these early movies, you were working with Tim Roth, who was already on Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction, Renee Zellweger, who had been on Jerry Maguire. So as a young director working with some of these people, did you learn from them along the way? Oh, yeah, I, I hugely. I learned a ton from them. They, you know, uh, especially Tim was a great example. He'd already done a lot of work and Ellen Burstyn was in that movie. So she, you know, is an incredible legendary actress. But the person I learned the most from those early movies was the cinematographer, this guy named Bill Butler, who was the cinematographer of Jaws and The Godfather and The wow. Conversation. And he was probably 80 years old at the time. He, he wore the same thing every day, ate the same soup every day, never changed. And he imparted a lot of wisdom. And, and, and you know what? He's still alive. He's 101. You were the creator and EP of Surface, which shot here in town. Yeah. Um, what was it about Wilmington that you shot many of your projects here? You brought Surface here and then you and Jennifer moved here yeah. to raise your kids. We all I've ever really wanted to do was make movies in North Carolina. And, uh, you know, I felt for a while that I had to go to L.A. to get a chance. And then uh, I found, honestly, that I'm almost it's easier for me here than it is out there. So I'm, I, I really prefer working here. And we're, I'm so thankful that we have this rebate here where shows can be made here. That's so critical. I feel like it's so good for the local community. And um, I'm part of the governor's uh, film commission where we work hard to try to keep that going, you know, and thank you to Michael Lee who helps with that. Appreciate that. And, um, uh, you know, it's just been good to, to be back here. We just want to make sure we, I feel like it's now part of the fabric of Wilmington and I just feel like it's, I hope it keeps going. Jennifer was in the business for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I know, and I've told people that I would not be as successful as I am had I not married a saint because all the hours that I had to work to just to make a name for myself and, and, and do that, Sheila is the one who really took the lead role in raising our kids. And yeah. our kids are who they are because of my wife. And I, and I will tell that to my dying breath. Yeah. What about Jennifer? Uh, I imagine you're off. I imagine you're away. You're working long hours, whether it's writing or whatever it is. How important is she to your success, knowing the industry the way she does? I mean, John, you know, what you just said is so unbelievably true in my case as well. And, uh, you know, I, I tell young people all the time when they ask me about film, I say the thing you don't think about is how it affects families because you're, uh, you are often on location and the hours are crazy and um, you really do need a supportive and understanding and smart and tough partner. And, uh, and Jen is a hundred percent that. And, she she's she's always found ways to work at certain times when there was a little window and both of our kids are now in college so we're empty nesters and jen and i are back working together we're getting ready to we just produced this uh this pilot together so it's been so much fun like she 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 would she had this great career she raised two amazing kids and as soon as it's over she's right back at it so super super lucky to have her well you're lucky you can work together with your wife because sheila wants me nowhere near what she does <laughs> <laughs> I just do what she says, that's all. You're part of the Governor's Advisory Council, like you said. HB2, I know that impacted you being able to shoot Outer Banks here. Yeah. How frustrating was that when you knew Wilmington, you'd worked here? I mean, really you can imagine. It, I think to be here, right? I, I mean, I, you, I wanted to pull my hair out. I mean, you, if you know the show, like all we do is talk about Mason Burrow and figure eight. And, um, uh, so we 100% planned it to be here, thought it was going to be here. At the 11th hour, we hit this snag of HB2, and most of it had actually been repealed. There was just one yeah. tiny little remnant of it that was still on the, on the books. Netflix, you know, took a strong position that they wouldn't do it unless all laws were inclusive, which we agreed with, of course. And I always laugh. And they, so they sent us to that super liberal state of South Carolina to shoot, right? It makes it, you know, kind of funny, honestly. But... um. <laughs> Uh, but we love, you know, my mom, I, knew, I had a lot of family in Charleston. My mom had lived in Charleston for a long time. So um, that, I knew that place well. So that was the second place, best place we could have shot. And, um, and hopefully this new show, the band show, will shoot here. Well, 
Can you fill us in on that band project show? I mean, I've seen, we get a lot of emails that they have a filming permit here, they're shooting here. What's the pitch and, and, and where might that show up? Well, it's about a group of young friends on uh, the eve of high school graduation that are just in a band for fun. And they get a new member sort of at the last second and the music sort of coalesces and suddenly they all realize maybe we shouldn't go to college or to go work with our dad's business or parents' business. Maybe we should just throw our lot in together and see if this band thing can work. And that that's basically the pitch. And I think what makes it special is we did this search for young musicians all across the country. We had uh, Chase Stokes, who's the, who plays John B. in the show, put out an APB on his social media for bands. We got 5,000 bands sent to us. We picked this guitarist, that drummer, this bass player. We put them together. We've had them play and practice for the last two years. They've probably played 20 gigs now, and they wrote an album, and they are were so good. All their own music. That it's just so much fun. So that's what that's what we're doing. And uh, we had we shot it just a couple months ago in Wilmington, really all over town. And we're excited to uh, to get it out into the world pretty soon. I, before I let you go, I have to ask you, what's the secret? You said earlier it's hard. You've been you've hung around this business for a long time, had success, worked on projects that have had big names. What's the secret? Do, I'd say, I don't know if I can limit it to three. I'd say, just do what you do what you love. Tell the stories. If you do that, it starts to uh, come through to other people. In other words, don't create something that you think is going to work. Just do something that you like and see what happens. Well, it's awesome. Outer Banks is, uh, again, available Thursday, February 23rd, the third season. It's already proven to be a smash hit. Jonas, congratulations on everything, uh, your lovely family, your two successful children, and your career as well. I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're slam busy. Thanks for being on the One on One podcast. My honor, John. Thanks so much. Nice to talk to you. A huge thank you to Jonas Pate for taking time from his busy schedule and joining us here on the One on One podcast to talk about season three of Outer Banks and of course his very successful career in television and film. You can follow Jonas on social media. One place he's very active is on Instagram. Jonas J. Pate is what you look for. And don't forget, Outer Banks is all over social media. Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, go there and follow season three as it starts streaming February 23rd. Now, before we go, I'd like to ask you a favor. Please follow or subscribe to the One on One with John Evans podcast on whatever app you use to listen to your favorite shows. And if you would be so kind, please leave us a rating or a review. We really do want to know what you think of our interviews and the more feedback and recommendations we get from friends like you, the higher we'll be listed on all of those apps and the better chance we'll have of bringing in even more new listeners. I'm John Evans. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of One on One.